It's very good to see you. If you would, open your Bibles to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 16. In 1 Kings 16, toward the end of that chapter, we read about Ahab. King Ahab was the most wicked king Israel ever had. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29, beginning, it says, In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. So we recognize that King Ahab here had forsaken the Lord. He had turned his back on the Lord. And that when he married this Jezebel, he married not just a Gentile, but he married an idolatrous woman who was wholly devoted to Baalism, to that false religion of idol worship. And she had a persuasion or an influence with Ahab to where he permitted and allowed the promotion of Baalism in the land of Israel, in that northern kingdom. If you notice that it says here in verse 32, then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. So he became active in being a worshiper of Baal and promoting the worship of Baal. Verse 33, it says, And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now, while this wickedness is infesting the land, we understand that God was not sitting idly by and just letting these things unfold. But God was active. God was aware of what was going on. and He was not content just to allow this to go unchecked or unaddressed, if you will. So when we read down in 1 Kings chapter 17, we see how the Lord acts and He sends Elisha the prophet, or Elijah rather, the prophet. And he declares to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, these shall not, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And so Elijah was sent to announce the drought that would come upon the land of Israel with the intent and the purpose of bringing them to their knees, bringing them to the point of repentance and turning back to God and serving and honoring Him. So as this drought grows worse and worse, there is great suffering in that land. As we are going to continue to study on into 1 Kings 18, and that's where we'll spend most of our time, we're going to see this account where you have Elijah the prophet standing against Ahab and the prophets of Baal. And you have Jehovah God standing against the idol, Baal. And when you read through this chapter, you see what unfolds, you realize that there is a declaration that there is only one true God. And it is to Him that we owe our loyalty. We see this battle of good and evil, and we really see here a battle between reality and and fantasy. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But let's get into 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's read verses 1 and 2 here. 1 Kings 18, 1 and 2. It says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. Now the account continues on from there to explain how it is that Elijah came to meet Ahab. 
When Elijah goes out, he appears to Obadiah, who was a servant of Ahab. But he was also one who loved and respected God. And when Jezebel was campaigning against the prophets of Jehovah and executing them and putting them to death, Obadiah hid a hundred prophets. It says 50 to a cave, and he made sure they were fed with bread and water. Now, to us that doesn't sound like a lot, but compared to death and in the midst of a severe famine, he was doing a lot to help out those prophets. And when Elijah appears to him, Obadiah is very nervous because he says, you're telling me to go get Ahab, but if I go get Ahab and come back, you won't be here and Ahab will kill me. But Elijah reassures him, I'm going to be here, I will talk to Ahab. And so Obadiah complies and he goes and he gets Ahab. And that's where we pick up in verses 17 through 19 and notice what happens here. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah confronts Ahab essentially to issue this challenge to him. But note that when he first appears to Ahab, or when Ahab first sees him, that Ahab says, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And from one perspective, Ahab could make an argument that Elijah has brought all this trouble to us, this severe famine, this lack of food, there's no water, no rain, all the suffering that everyone is going through, it's his fault because he's the one who came and told us that this was going to happen. So they would point the finger at him, point the finger, if you will, at the messenger. So that's what Ahab's doing here. It, it's your fault that all of this has happened. But Elijah turns around and makes the point, rightly so, no, I'm not the problem here, you're the problem. Because you and your house have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. That's why all of this has happened. So he wouldn't allow Ahab to get away with the misdirection or really the lie that he is bringing to bear against Elijah the prophet here. So then Elijah tells him, go get the prophets of Baal, get the people, let's all gather up on Mount Carmel, and we will determine the true God, whether that is Jehovah or whether that is Baal. And we'll see more of that in just a moment here. Verse 20 then. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore let them give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the bull, the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. So Elijah, the first thing he does with the people is he admonishes them in verse 21. How long are you going to falter between two opinions? The idea is, how long are you going to ride the fence here? How long are you going to be undecided whether Baal is God or whether Jehovah is God? You need to make up your mind. You need to come to a firm conviction you need to have a decision here and stick with that decision. So he rebukes the people for riding the fence. And the people don't answer. They're not going to respond. We see that very often actually in the Bible when someone doesn't want to answer a question that maybe they know the exact truth or maybe they're fearful. Maybe they don't want to give up their sin. They don't want to answer the question. And so they, they answer not a word. Then Elijah says, okay, here's how we're going to settle this issue. I propose, they get a bull, I get a bull, 
They built an altar. They put it all together. They call on their God. I'll call on my God. And whoever answers by fire is the true God. And the people can see, okay, that makes sense. That would show the one who is living. The one who has power. That will show it. And so they agree to that. Yes, let's have that contest. So we jump on down now to verses 25 to 29 and see the contest unfold. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. See, these prophets of Baal prepare that altar. And we see them calling on Baal. But twice it makes the point, there's no response. There's no answer. No one is paying attention. Now the reason that no one is paying attention is because Baal is not real. It's a figment of their imagination. It would be sort of like today if somebody decided they were going to have a church of Superman. Right? Superman. A made-up superhero in the comics, in the movies, all of that. And somebody said, well, there's this great powerful being named Superman and let's build an altar to Superman and let's pray to Superman and let's worship to Superman let's offer sacrifices what would we think? They're crazy. Because Superman's made up. That's what Baal is. Baal is made up. He's a figment of their imaginations as all idols are figments of man's imaginations. They're from the imaginations of man's heart. And so we understand that this false religion, as all false religion is, is futile. There's no response, no answer. And we understand that as this is unfolding and they're there leaping about the altar, it says that they did this from morning till noonday. So they've done it for several hours now, and Elijah mocks them. Because he recognizes and he's trying to get the people to recognize that this is utter foolishness. But they continue on. They get more excited to the point that they cut themselves and the blood is pouring out of them. And still there is no result. They continue that until the evening sacrifice. Now we read beginning in verse 30 how Elijah responds to this and what he does to get Jehovah to respond. In verse 30, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, 
and lift up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. So we see Elijah prepares a sacrifice. He builds that altar out of 12 stones. There's symbolism in that for the 12 tribes. But he builds that altar there and notice that it says in verse 30 that he told the people, come near to me. Come near. Come and look at what I'm doing. They were there to be able to see how he was building it. There's no trickery here. I haven't built anything in. It's you know something like Simon the Sorcerer and I'm going to act like I have power when I don't have power. You're going to see it. You're witnessing it up close. Do the eyewitness inspection, if you will. And so they are near and they are watching and observing everything that is being done. And then he tells the people after everything is built and set up and ready, go and get the water pots, fill them up and pour it. And he did that three times and then he filled up the trench that was around the altar. So there's no way that somebody maybe could be over here and run some fire in there and maybe light something on the ground and it goes to it. There's no way that this thing's going to light. That's not how you build a fire or offer a sacrifice, a burnt offering, if you will. This is completely opposite of how you would normally do it. So he prepared it so that when it happened, there's no room for doubt or questioning about what has unfolded before the eyes of the people. And that is really to the point of there's nothing that truth has to hide. It's open. Look. See the evidence for yourself, if you will. So Elijah prayed to God. Now notice Elijah's prayer compared to the prayers of the idolater worshipers, the prophets of Baal, the 450 there. They're leaping about the altar for several hours and Elijah mocks them and then they get really into a frenzy and cut themselves up. And what does Elijah do? He gets down and says a prayer. I haven't timed that out. Maybe you want to do that, but just read his prayer there a few seconds. And God answers by fire. And burns up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, all the water that was in the trench, all of that is gone. And so the people then respond showing that they are penitent to some degree and declaring the Lord He is God, the Lord He is God. Elijah said, here's how we're going to prove it. Let them do their thing, call on their God, I'll call on my God, and whoever answers by fire is God. The people had agreed, yes, we agree with that. And when it happened, it was overwhelming to them, and they could not but help, if you will, to declare that the Lord is God. Now notice what happened. Then with the prophets of Baal in verse 40, Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. So these false prophets paid for their idolatry with their life. There was a consequence to their false religion and what they had practiced. But we go on further, and if we read verses 41 to 46, we see where Elijah tells Ahab you need to get ready because the rain is coming. How that Elijah bows down before God and he prays to God that he would send rain. And he tells his servant, go and look toward the sea and tell me what you see. And he goes out and he says, I see nothing. He says, go back. After he prayed again. And his servant saw nothing. And he told him to go again seven times. It says in verse 44. And when his servant came back he said there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea so he said go up say to Ahab prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you now it happened in the meantime the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain and so the rain came back the rain returned after his prayer and plea with God let's draw some lessons out of this Backing up again to verse 18. When Elijah was confronted by Ahab and accused of being the troublemaker, Elijah responded that you have troubled Israel because you and your father's house have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. 
One principle we learn here is those who go into sin, those who accept false teaching and false doctrine, they are the ones that cause trouble, not the faithful people of God. The people of God are often accused of causing trouble. If we question someone's religious beliefs or practices, they believe we are causing trouble. We're stirring up things that we don't need to stir up. But we are not the ones causing the problem. The problem is the sin, the error, the false doctrine. When we refuse to go along with or approve of sin, we're accused of being troublemakers. So if we don't go along with lying, maybe in the workplace or maybe even in the home, we don't go along with the lie to cover things up, to make people look better, to hide the problem, then sometimes we're accused of being the problem. Sometimes it is that we are attacked and accused of stirring up trouble and causing people suffering in this life because we oppose things like homosexuality. And we post that online or something, or we speak up in the workplace. It's getting more and more treacherous to do that. Oh, you're causing the trouble because you won't accept our beliefs, because you won't accept what we think you should believe on homosexuality, transgenderism, whatever else is out there now, they want to push it and force it. It used to be the mantra was, you need to accept us. Well, it's no longer you need to accept us. You need to approve of us. And if you don't, then you're a problem. And we're going to punish you for that. But don't let them fool you into thinking that you're the problem. You're not the problem. The problem is the sin. The problem is the promotion and the advancement and the enforcement of sin. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5, Jesus addressed this in the Sermon on the Mount with His disciples about how the people who are faithful to Him are going to face the persecution. Matthew 5 verse 11, He says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for My sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who are before you. They persecuted Elijah. They were persecuting other prophets during the time of Ahab and Jezebel, putting them to death if they could get them. And they will continue to persecute the people of God until the end of time. But he says you're blessed in that. God knows it. God recognizes it. And that's the right thing to do in spite of what you may face. But again, the problem comes from the people who accept and promote sin, not from people who are standing up for what is right. <coughs> the other thing we want to notice in 1 Kings chapter 18, down in verse 21, Elijah had asked the people, how long do you falter between two opinions? And what he's essentially telling them is you need to take a stand. But you know what? There's a lot of people that do not want to take a stand. They don't want to say, here's the truth, and that's it. They want to compromise. They want to ride that fence. They don't want to draw a sharp contrast between truth and error, between right and wrong. But we have to take a stand. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We understand that it's only through Him that someone can be forgiven of their sins and go to heaven. But more and more in our culture, and I know maybe we're a little isolated in the Bible Belt, but more and more in our culture, people are turning away from that concept. And we need to be ready to take a stand and not be moved off of the fact you have to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to submit to Him. He must be your Lord and Savior. And you must live as Him being your Lord and Savior if you have any hope of heaven. Outside of Christ there is no hope. And we have to take a strong stand on the fact that there's only one true church. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, talks about we're reconciled to God in one body. There is no reconciliation outside the church of Jesus Christ. Anybody who is not a member of that church is doomed. They're lost. That's unpopular. 
Sometimes there are brethren who waffle on that. Well, I'm not so sure about it. No, that's exactly what the Bible teaches. We are reconciled in one body. And there is no salvation, there is no redemption and joy outside of that one body. In Ephesians 4, verse 5, it says there is one Lord, one faith, one God and Father of all. There's only one truth, one system of truth. That's the Word of God. And it doesn't matter what other people claim. There is not the Word of God and science. Right? Because people try to pit science, so-called, against the Word of God. As though, well, we've discovered this in modern man. We just know all these things and we've done these experiments, which most of the time when they claim it's science against the Bible, it's not done to experiment. But anyway, that they'll try to say there is this body of truth out here that contradicts the Word of God. So you dismiss the Word of God and accept this body of truth that the experts have decided is true and tell you is true. Now there's one truth. That's the Word of God. Everything, everything must be filtered through it. Not the Word of God through what men tell us, but what men tell us through the Word of God. And if it doesn't match the Word of God, we reject it. That's not true. So we have to take a stand and not falter between two opinions as these people were between Jehovah and Baal. Again, back in 1 Kings chapter 18, this time down in verse 27, it says that Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal. He was ridiculing them. And you know there are times when error needs to be mocked, and the promoters of error need to be mocked and ridiculed. In Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said this, Matthew 23, or 24, verse 24, Matthew 23, 24. said, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. And of course, if you're familiar with Matthew 23, you know he is merciless to the Jewish leaders. But they are hypocrites. They are a brood of vipers. But he says, you... You strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. So you, you've got your drink sitting there on the table and a little gnat falls in it and you're going to strain that thing out so you're not defiled. So you're going to do that, but you'll swallow a whole camel? You see, he's mocking them. He's ridiculing them for that attitude. So it might be like this. Okay, so the pyramids and Stonehenge represent intelligent extra extraterrestrial life. But the human body is a result of random chance? Do you want me to believe that? So a pile of rocks that organized says that there is extraterrestrial life that people, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say people, these beings, whatever they are, have traveled millions or hundreds of millions of light years and happened to find our planet in the midst of the vastness of the universe and they put a pile of rocks together? You're, you're telling me that's what's happening here? And the pyramids are the same way? That's, that's ridiculous. It's as ridiculous as these prophets of Baal leaping and running around the altar and cutting themselves. It's just utter foolishness. We shouldn't be ashamed to say that. It's ridiculous. I cannot accept that. And you tell me that the human body is just random chance of molecules and time. It's absolutely absurd. Now we want to be cautious when we ridicule, when we mock, when we use sarcasm. But there is definitely a place for it in advancing the truth and exposing the absurdity of error. We go back to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 28 then. As it talks about them cutting themselves and crying aloud. And maybe you've noticed this and thought about this before, that these prophets of Baal really believed. They wouldn't cut themselves 
unless they actually believed there was a Baal that would respond to them. They believed. They were sincere in their conviction that there is this God with powers called Baal. But convictions and feeling do not equal the truth. They do not equal reality. It doesn't matter how you feel or what you believe, personally, individually. It does not matter at all. You know, people used to believe the earth is flat. There's still people who believe the earth is flat. It's not reality. And what they believe and what they're doing is not reality. And there are a lot of false doctrines out there that people believe. They sincerely believe it. They're wholly committed to it. And will even give their lives for things that are a lie, that are not true. But they believe it. You think about Islam. There's plenty of people in this world who have given their lives for Islam. That's totally a lie. It's completely false. There is no truth or reality to it. There are people who are convicted that faith alone saves. It doesn't make it true. But they believe it. They believe it with all their heart. They go to their graves believing that. There are people who believe that an instrument of music in worship service is acceptable because it makes them feel good. But because it makes them feel good or because they believe it's okay or because they believe that's how God is to be praised doesn't make it so. Being sincere in something does not determine whether or not it's truth. We can be sincerely wrong. Terribly wrong. And the more sincere we are in believing something that is wrong, the greater the danger that is to our souls. We have to go to the evidence. We have to go to the truth. What does the truth say? And be sincere in that. Another thing that we want to notice down in 1 Kings 18 verse 40 says, Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the Rook Kishon and executed them there. Let me ask you something. How did they execute them? Well, the normal way would have been taking a sword. Sort of like later we read about how that Samuel hacked Agag to pieces. Actually, before this, it's what Hacked him to pieces. They executed these guys, and it wasn't a sterile thing. You know, like today we enact the death penalty and basically somebody just falls off asleep because of a drug cocktail they're given. They just... No, they took a sword and chopped them up. That's what's happening. And it's just this point that we want to get. You know, there are times we have to draw the sword of the Spirit. And we have to get to work with that sword of the Spirit. Remember 2 Timothy, or rather 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We have these weapons, spiritual weapons, that have been given to us by the Lord, including the sword of the Spirit, which is intended to hack away at error and lies and falsehoods. That's what it's there for. But some people won't put their hand to the sword. Some people believe, they'll tell you, yes, I believe in fighting the good fight of faith. But when the battle is upon them, they're squeamish. They don't want to do it. It's too hard, too bad, too gory, if you will. And they recoil in horror and disgust when someone does wield the sword of truth. When somebody takes that sword out, and chops away at air, there are people who get very upset about that. But the reality is, if we're going to be the people of God standing up for truth and right, and we're going to stand against air idolatry, which is all air ultimately is, if we're going to do that, we're going to take the sword and we're going to chop away 
And we're going to support those who do that. It'd be like us standing there with Elijah. Oh, Elijah, no, don't kill them. Please don't kill those prophets of Baal. You've gone too far now. You've already proved your point. Just let it go. Now, we need to use the sword of the Spirit effectively to advance the cause of Christ and to destroy and tear down the air that is out there. The other thing we want to note before we leave 1 Kings chapter 18 is the fact that Elijah's prayer was powerful. We, we look at the fact that he prayed and God responded by fire and then he prayed and God responded with rain, sent water from the skies. You know, that's very interesting, isn't it? That he sent fire from the sky, then he sent water from the sky. Responding to Elijah's prayer, if we go to James chapter 5, James chapter 5, James makes a great point out of this. In James 5 verse 16, he says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Think about how powerful a prayer that was. It says that he prayed it would not rain three and a half years it didn't rain. He prayed that it would rain and the rain came back. That's a powerful prayer. And yes, I understand that God directed him to do it, but there's a lot of things God directs us to do, but we are also to pray for those things. It's so reassuring, it's so comforting to know that we can persuade the Creator of the universe through our prayers. That He will hear and He will respond. We can, if you will, in a sense, as Elijah did, open and close the heavens. God still works in this world today. Still works in His providence in bringing about good and right. And you know, we can change the course of a life, of an individual life, of a family, or even of a nation. We need to be appealing to God for good and right and truth to prevail. We will open up to number 832. 832. This stunning account that we've looked at of good versus evil, reality versus fantasy, ought to cause us to be motivated that we would be resolved not to falter between two opinions, between the religion of Christ and the ways of the world, it should motivate us to bravely stand up against error. And it should compel us that we go before God and seek His help, seek His wisdom in our lives and the lives of others who are around us. If you've never obeyed the gospel, if you're not a Christian, you've not been reconciled to God in that one body, we encourage you to do that today, to commit your soul to the one true God. And you can do that if you will believe that Jesus is the Christ and confess that before this audience. Turn away from your sin and be baptized to have your sins washed away. And if you're a child of God, that you've strayed from Him, that you've begun to falter between two opinions, then won't you repent of that today? Turn to God. Seek His forgiveness and His mercy, which He will extend to you. If you need to respond, won't you do so now while we stand and sing?